I'm Gabrielle Weiniger. This is The Debka Files, bringing you exclusive news and insight from the Middle East and around the world. Coming up on this week's show, a Debka Files exclusive. Russian forces install Iranian and Hezbollah militia in Kenetra on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. The Islamic State group seizes control of the main desert highways leading to the Syrian-Iraqi border after launching a surprise offensive on the Syrian army. And Trump aides visit the region to observe a new initiative headed by Egypt, Saudi and the UAE to create a unified Palestinian leadership and return to the negotiating table with Israel. Now to our top story this week, and Debka Files can exclusively reveal that Russian forces have installed Iranian Revolutionary Guards and Hezbollah Shiite militia at a joint administration center in Kanetra, that's in southwestern Syria, in a high valley in the Golan Heights. This according to our military and intelligence sources there. Now it comes after Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, publicly threatened to go to war there over what he charged were Iran's attempts to establish a permanent military foothold in the war-torn country. Speaking to the press after a three-hour-long talks with President Vladimir Putin at Russia's Black Sea resort of Sochi, Netanyahu said that if that happens, Israel will not remain passive, nor if Syria becomes a link in Iran's overland corridor via Iraq and Syria to Lebanon. Take a listen before we delve into the details of this new development on the Golan Heights. Iran כבר בתהליכי השתלטות מתקדמים על עיראק ועל תימן, ולמעשה היא כבר שולטת בלבנה. ואנחנו לא שוכחים לרגע שאיראן מוסיפה לאיים כל יום על השמדת ישראל. היא מחמשת ארגוני טרור, היא מחוללת טרור בעצמה. Now, spotters saw troops moving just around two kilometers from the Golan frontier. That's the closest Iranian and Hezbollah troops have ever come to Israel's Syrian border. They were brought over from their base at Khan al-Naba, that's six kilometers east of the Golan. Our sources report that the center is a military civil body established by the Russians to manage the de-escalation zone in Kanetra. That's one of four zones U.S. President Donald Trump and Russian President Putin agreed to establish in Syria when they met in Hamburg at the G20 summit in early July. Since then, Russian forces were stationed along the Syrian side of the Golan Heights, setting up their command center and running around 10 observation posts along the border with Israel. But on Saturday, everything changed as Russian officers were seen driving Iranian and Hezbollah officers in civilian garb into the town of Kanetra and housing them in the administration center. Now, to find out what all this means, let's turn to this week's guest, Dr. Murghai Kedar, a scholar in Arabic culture and a lecturer at bar -Ilan University. Dr. Kedar, thank you very much for being here with us. Israel has, thank you. Israel has repeatedly objected to this arrangement on its border. We saw Prime Minister Netanyahu turn last week to Vladimir Putin and the week prior an Israeli delegation that headed to Washington to seek guarantees for its border safety. Has Moscow and the U.S. turned a deaf ear to this request? Well, this is the result of the fact that Israel did not take part in the war on Syria because all those powers like Russia, uh, Iran, Hezbollah, all kinds of militias, the Kurds, all those who were fighting in order to save Syria now harvest the fruits of their fight. But Israel, Israel has out. targeted Syria before. We've seen them strike Hezbollah convoys before. This but actually proves that Hezbollah were there. And they were trying to liberate Syria from the rebels and from the Daesh and all those who tried to topple Assad. Israel did not take part in the war on Syria. Israel kept very strictly out from the Syrian arena. Now Israel cannot demand that whatever happens in Syria will actually take Israel in account because Israel was not there for the war. So they don't take Israel seriously and they actually divide the bear skin now in Syria between Russians, between Iranians, Hezbollah, Kurds, all the others those who took part in the war through the last six years. So we cannot uh, watch something from outside and then try to be part of the arrangements afterwards. Well, Israel does say that they um, don't, have never struck before and they don't intervene in Syria, but we have seen them strike convoys, uh, Hezbollah convoys in, in Syria before. So how is that a non-intervention policy? 
Well, unfortunately, they don't take Israel uh, seriously. Israel kept saying once and again that we will not allow having Hezbollah on our border uh, on the Golan, not to mention Iran. Okay, we said, and we said it twice and thrice and maybe, many, maybe more times, but apparently neither the Russians nor the Iranians take us seriously. Now <laughs> Israel will have to decide what Israel is doing if we see officially uh, Iranian troops uh, uh, deployed on the borders across from the, from the Golan. So but this in is that not case, what will Israel do next? Doesn't that mark a red line if we are seeing those troops there? Look, and you know what? The troops on the Golan are not the biggest problem. Uh, if, for example, Iran succeeds to, to put her, its hand on a sea harbor on the Mediterranean in Syria, just imagine that, let's say, Tartus or Banias or maybe Latakia harbor starts to serve uh, uh, Iranian vessels. Who can control what kind of missiles, tanks, cannons, and who, who knows what more they can bring only in one ship? Way much more than they would bring with airplanes as they did until this very day. Although the Security Council banned Iran from uh, exporting any weapons. They <laughs> export big time. They export weapons to, to Yemen, to Syria, to Iraq, to Lebanon, to wherever they like, and the world does not do anything against the Iranian expansion uh, through the last few years. Dr. Kedar, let's bring it back to the rebels. Israel's been supporting various local Syrian rebels with medical and logistical aid for at least the last four years. Will this now change, and what are the options for those rebels in terms of their coordination with Israel, now that there are other forces on the ground who will assumably uh, be opposed to this? Well, if uh, those, all of those rebels, the Sunni rebels, uh, are defeated, and apparently this is what will be if the Russians and the Syrians and, and, uh, and the Iranians and the Iraqi militias and the Afghani militias, all those Shiite militias, not to mention Hezbollah, will continue their assault on them, they will uh, give up and they will run away. And not, not only this, the Syrian regime, after they gain control over the parts of Syria which were populated by Sunnis, they will actually ethnic cleanse the country from Sunnis. Because don't forget, the Sunnis, what we see today, is already the second round of violence between the Sunni population, which is the majority in Syria, against the regime. The first round was between 1976 and 1982, which was finished by the massacre in Hamat in, in February 1982. So if the Sunni majority doesn't like the regime, so the regime will kick them out. I, I think that in the, in the near future, we'll see waves, new waves, of millions of Syrian refugees going out from Syria to exile wherever it is, mainly in Europe. And this is what we are going to see in the last, in, in, the, in the forthcoming uh, in months uh, out of Syria. Okay, Dr. Kedar, stay with us and let us stay with the Iranian involvement in the region. And in Iraq, forces say they are about to take control of Tal Afar, the last ISIS stronghold in the country's northwest. 60 kilometers west of Mosul and around 150 kilometers east of the Syrian border, it's strategically positioned on what was a major ISIS supply route between Mosul and their de facto capital, Raqqa. Around 300,000 Iraqi units fought for the key city under the command of General Abdul Amir Rashid Yarallah, the same units that fought to retake Mosul. But, Debka Files sources say, these units have been attached to the Hashid al-Shabi the Iraqi Shiite Popular Mobilization Units, or PMU, whose chief Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis is under the direct command of Revolutionary Guards No. 1, General Qasem Soleimani. Now, all this and an unannounced visit by U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis to Iraq just days after the offensive on Tal Afar, where a U.S.-led coalition is providing air support to Iraqi troops. Uh, we in this coalition will remain steadfast with our Iraqi allies all the way through the defeat of ISIS. It's not over yet. There's hard fighting ahead. They're aware of this, and they are committed to it. In fact, they want to accelerate it. And at the same time, we want to avoid any obstacles to the teamwork. And so far, that is working uh, very well.
our point right now is to stay focused like a laser beam on the defeat of ISIS and to let nothing distract us. And that's the, uh, the point I'll make when we get to uh, Erbil. Mattis also met with the president of the Kurdish regional government in Erbil to persuade leaders to put their referendum on ice. So to break down how all this interacts, let's bring back our guest, Dr. Mordechai Kadar. Let's start with the PMU's involvement in the retaking of Tel Afar. They've been an official part of the Iraqi army since November last year. How connected are they to Iran? And what will it mean for who holds the city after its eventual recapture? Well, uh, the Iranian investment in Iraq actually came to a degree that today large parts of the Iraqi army are actually under Iranian control. Just think about the situation when the American army is under Russian control. This is actually what happened in, in Iraq only because the world was too much concentrated on defeating ISIS in, at any price. Even in the price, even if the price is that Iran takes Iraq and parts of Syria and maybe Lebanon as well through Hezbollah, all over, means that Iran now actually constitutes a whole a gateway to the Mediterranean Sea by a whole a combination of countries like Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, today, they actually have almost uh, very free access to the Mediterranean Sea. And this is what they wanted to do. And this is why they invested so much in Tel Afar, in Mosul, and in many other places as well. Well, Mattis' visit, it wasn't planned. So would Iranian cooperation in the liberation of the city have even been discussed in meetings with Iraqi officials? Look, Iraqis today are also operated by the Iranians. When you talk to Iraqis, you actually talk to their bosses. And their bosses today live in Tehran, or maybe in Qom as well. And this is the situation. And this empowerment of Iran actually started in the days of Obama. And today, Trump, uh, in, the, in this administration, they cannot change the trend and the direction which the Middle East takes already from the years of Obama, who tried to do anything in order to empower Iran by giving them the money, by giving them the uh, nuclear uh, uh, agreement, and everything was meant in order to empower Iran. And today, we actually harvest the bitter uh, fruits which come from the Obama tree today on the Middle East. Let's take it back to the fight for Tel Afar. It seems to be falling much quicker than Mosul. Is this spelling the end for the so-called Islamic State? If the trend will continue and the pressure will continue, they are losing a, a, a lens from, let's say, two years ago when the, a, when the coalition started to work seriously against the Islamic State. So far, they lost, I think, even more than half of the land which they held until two years ago. So uh, if the pressure continues, and it is continuing as much as I uh, can see, uh, their defeat is only a matter of time, maybe uh, months or maybe even weeks, depends on how pressure will be maintained on them. All right, Dr. Kadar, let's take it back to the diplomatic arena. After returning from Baghdad, the U.S. Defense Secretary Mattis visited Ankara to hold talks with his t Turkish counterpart. On the agenda, the Pentagon's decision to arm Kurdish YPG fighters in the operation to retake Raqqa from ISIS. Now, Ankara views the YPG as the Syrian extension of the Kurdish PKK militant group, which it's fighting in southeastern Turkey. And it's viewed also as a terrorist organization by the United States. Just after Mattis' visit, Turkey announced its chief of staff would visit Iran to continue high-powered discussions that began last week by Iranian military chiefs in Ankara. Those discussions are the first of their kind between the regional rivals since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Now, the main issue on the agenda, combating extremists in the northern Syrian province of Idlib, either setting up a de-escalation zone in the province or to launch a joint offensive with Iran to wipe them out. But they also agreed to undertake joint military action against the Kurds in Iraq and Syria, namely against the PKK in the Kandal region along the Iraqi-Iranian border. Let's delve into this a little further with our guest, Dr. Mordechai Kadar, scholar in Arabic culture and lecturer at bar Ilan University. These are major, re major regional rivals now becoming frenemies. The timing seems quite significant here, given the up upcoming September 25th Kurdish independence referendum. 
What's the main reason behind this re rapprochement and how did it come about? Well, don't forget the, the, the Kurds are actually marching on the path to independence since uh, January to, uh, 1991. Since the world actually banned the Iraqi forces, and then under, the, under Saddam, from flying above the Kurdish uh, district because the, Kurdish, the, the, the Iraqi regime was attacking the Kurds from the air, and we all remember what happened in Khalabcha. So the world actually, and the, and the aftermath of the war on, to liberate Kuwait in 1991, actually did not allow Iraq to fly again above the uh, Kurdish district. This is actually what allowed or enabled the Kurds to, uh, to establish their army, the Peshmerga, and their government, and their political parties, and mass media, and their own economy. And, um, the, and, and factually, um, I think already for like 15 years, or even more, the Kurdish district of Iraq is uh, factually independent. They have their own army, they have their own political uh, arena, they have their own parties. Even, the, even elections inside the Kurdish district, they hold regularly. And the economy of the Kurdish district in Iraq is flourishing. Irbil is one of the most uh, developed uh, towns, the, 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 the capital of the Kurdish district. It's one of the most developed uh, uh, cities in the whole Middle East. The so is this a reaction Greens. to this? Is this rapprochement between Iran and Turkey a reaction to this autonomy? Look, they, uh, aren't there numerous the Kurds, differences as well Kurds, between Iran and Turkey? They ha they're fighting, I mean, look, they're on opposing sides of the Syrian war, not to mention their stance on Iraq and Yemen. Uh, they're both competing for influence in the region, so how can they become friends? Look, friendship here in the Middle East is made, made on interests. When an entity is too powerful to mess with, it's the interest of all the others to make peace with this entity. It's not because people love peace. People love to subjugate others. People love to take advantage of others. But uh, uh, countries and states and the regimes, uh, when they are too powerful to mess with, this is when they get peace. Now, the Kurdish district of Iraq, apparently they feel strong enough with their army, with their economy, with their, I, I would say even the awareness of the people, which is very important as a, some kind of power from, which comes from, from within. And they decided to march further on their path in order to reach the point which they can declare statehood. And don't forget that the Kurdish nation, which is today divided between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, is the biggest the biggest ethnic group in the world which does not have a state until this very day. And they definitely, in my humble view, they definitely deserve to have a state, and they will have it if they want. And they will impose their will on all the others, whether it's the Turks or the Iranians or the Iraqis the, um, the, uh, the, uh, or the Americans or the, even the Russians. They will go forward because they feel that they deserve a state. And in my humble view, no nation should stand in their, in their way because this is a historic justice okay, Dr. to give them a state. Thank you very much for that analysis. Let's move along now. An ISIS tanks launched a surprise offensive on Syria's elite Tiger forces Thursday in the desert region east of Raqqa. They snatched several villages southeast of their de facto capital as well as Syrian camps and positions, leaving around 100 Syrian and allied pro-Iranian Shiite militia dead and hundreds of others wounded. It's left ISIS in control of the main desert highways leading to its current bastions at Mayadeen and Abu Kamal, those towns located on the Syrian-Iraqi border. It's also given ISIS a vantage point against the PMU in Tel Afar, leading an Iraqi army contingent to cross into Syria last Friday to back up the Syrian army's efforts in throwing back the ISIS assault. Now, Depka Files military sources can reveal for the first time that ISIS have also pushed back the Syrian army and allies, including Hezbollah, from the southern bank of the Euphrates River. This despite Syria's military claiming it had crossed the river. In fact, while a few troops did cross to the other side, they were destroyed before they had a chance to set up a bridgehead to control the valley on the border with Iraq. Let's bring back today's guest, Dr. Mordechai Kadar. We've had a lot of talk from Western experts that the ISIS caliphate is shrinking in Iraq and Syria, 
and therefore they've been upping their attacks in Europe, just like we saw in Barcelona and Finland. Uh, does Thursday's attack in Syria and the subsequent capture of new slices of territory in the Syrian desert perhaps suggest otherwise? Well, I, I, I don't think it's too significant. Uh, every, day, every day, I would say, there are exchanges of areas. One power occupies from the other one, and in the next week they will occupy it back. And we, we don't have to really look at things from the prism of one day of what happens on the battlefield. We should see things in the long run. During the last months, the trend is very clear that the Islamic State is actually losing uh, uh, parts of land which the Islamic State was controlling until recently. And this is what, what is important. Every day there are clashes and wars and, 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 and battles. Definitely one day we, they won and the, and the other day the others won, win. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the trend should be taken in a little bit uh, further from We'll the, keep a from close the eye on that. Issues. Dr. Mordechai Kadar, scholar in Arabic culture and lecturer at Bar Ilan University. Thanks for being with us this week Pleasure. as we move to our final headline. U.S. President Donald Trump's advisors Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt visited Jerusalem and Ramallah last week amid a new back-channel regional peace push headed by Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. This after the freezing of the Israeli-Palestinian track now non-existent since the escalation over the Temple Mount in July. Devka Files can reveal the process is now focused on creating a fresh, unified Palestinian leadership. Egypt, for its, past, ha, for its part, has reopened the Rafa border crossing from Gaza to Sinai after a long closure. Now, the news in brief. After unveiling a new military strategy in Afghanistan, the Trump administration is looking at the level of support for allies fighting in the civil war in Yemen. A top U.S. commander in the Middle East, General Joseph Votel, traveled to Yemen this week to take a closer look at the Saudi mili military operations there. Saudi is leading a military alliance backing the internationally recognized government against Iran-allied Houthis in a war which has killed at least 10,000 people and unleashed a humanitarian catastrophe. A new industrial trade zone will be built by Russia and Egypt in East Port Said on the Suez Canal. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced an intergovernmental commission meeting this month to set the build in motion. Russia has a new ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, but he's on America's sanctions list over his role as Deputy Defense Minister when Moscow annexed Crimea in 2014. He replaces Sergei Kislyak, a star figure in the probe into Russian interference in the 2016 American elections. Iranian Intelligence Minister Mahmoud Alavi has announced that his forces have disbanded 120 terror groups and confiscated large amounts of explosives and weapons across the country over the past four years. That wraps up this week's show. Just a sample of Debka Weekly Newsletter you can get straight to your inbox. For the full range of exclusive news and insights, you can sign on at debka.com forward slash weekly. Thanks for joining us here at Debka Files from the ILTV studios in Tel Aviv. See you again next week.